Hello and welcome. This is Matthew, and today we are going to look at installing UserMod ZP60038 into our MVS 3.8 system. So this user mod comes from Prycroft 6. This is Greg Price's organization, which you may recognize from the review or RFE editor that we uh, heavily depend on on our mainframe. Uh, and also, as we look through the user mod list here, you'll note that he's collected uh, several user mods that we installed during the uh, system generation video series that we went through following Jay Mosley's instructions. So pretty important organization and resource in the MVS 3.8 community. And the user mod that we're installing today, ZP60038, is going to add a capability to our system that will allow any programs we develop and run under a C-list environment to get access to C-list symbolic variables. Uh, this is one of the user mods that we did not install during the system generation process, but we may want to install for this capability. In particular, this is a prerequisite uh, for certain functionality of Wally McLaughlin's ISPF implementation. Uh, so if you've emailed Wally and gotten his ISPF and want to install that, the first thing you'll want to do is install this ZP60038 user mod. Now, as you'll see, this is going to end up turning into a tutorial on uh, moving data between mainframes. We already looked at how we use receive 370 over in video 14. We're going to look at the other side of that. We're going to use xmit 370, which is the equivalent of the transmit command that's available in newer versions of TSO. Uh, but we're going to use that to transfer a data set over from the TK4- distribution of MVS. So we'll see why we need to do that in a minute. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll go through that whole process. But overall, what we're going to look at in this video is checking the prerequisites of ZP60038. And then we're going to attempt to install ZP60038, realize our system is missing some components that we need. We'll install those components uh, and then try this installation again. And we should end up with our system uh, nicely set up and installed with this 60038 user mod. Uh, so again, what is this user mod actually doing? The way I think of it, because I'm fundamentally a Unix guy, is if I'm writing a shell script and I set some environment variables, and then I launch an application or an executable, that executable has access to all of those environment variables that I set in my shell or in a shell script. Uh, this is also true in the DOS and Windows world, right? You're able to set environment variables, you can set those system-wide, you can set them in a batch file, and then if you execute a program, all of the programs on the system have access to the environment, environment variables, excuse me, the environment variables uh, from the environment in which they were launched. So this is providing essentially that same capability uh, in a TSO environment. Right? I can write C lists, which are like shell scripts or batch files in TSO. I can set symbolic variables in them. And using this IKJCT441 API that this user mod is going to add to our system, any executables, any programs that I execute from that C list environment will get access to those C list symbolic variables. There's the note here that the API is compatible with documentation available for similarly named modules from elsewhere. From elsewhere means from IBM in current versions of TSO. So once we install this sysmod, we should be able to follow the documentation from current ZOS documentation to learn how we're able to use this capability uh, to write programs that are able to set up requests to this capability and get access to variables. Uh, and then we'll be able to get the variable value, pointers to the variable value by following the right memory structures here. So that's kind of cool. So let's start by looking at the cover letter. Um, the cover letter is going to tell us that this modification has as prerequisites the modifications UY01301 and ZP60014. So this looks like it's probably a PTF, a program temporary fix from IBM, 
uh, to fix a bug or add a capability to the operating system. And then this ZP60014 is going to be another one of these uh, user mods from Prycroft. So just to eliminate the lack of fulfilling the prerequisites as any kind of uh, barrier for us moving forward, the first thing we're going to do is check on those prerequisites. So let's go over to our mainframe and log in to ATSO session. We'll go ahead and start up RFE. And from previous work we've done, I have in my control library some JCL here that works with SMP, the System Modification Program. So let's edit our existing JCL. And it looks like we were looking for the status of some installed sysmods. So we can just modify this. I'm going to look in the PTS. This is kind of the big holding tank of all potential sysmods that we've received, whether we've actually applied them to our system or not. And I'll just look for those two prerequisites. So those were UY01301 and ZP600. Four. So we're asking uh, through this SMP app catalog procedure, we're asking the SMP program uh, to list the data it has available from the PTS on these two sysmods. So we'll submit that. Uh, the name is Emilson S. So we'll look for that job. We'll start our output queue list. And there's our job, it's done. So let's take a look at that. No errors, that's always nice. If we go down to the bottom, back up a little, we can see that UY01301, that is a PTF. We have received it, but we have not applied or accepted that into our system. So during our system generation process, one of the steps was to receive all of the material from a tape of collected PTFs that the Hercules uh, mainframe community has attempted to recover from back in the MVS 3.8 days over the years. Uh, we applied some of them that uh, Jay Mosley and others had identified as probably being important uh, for the stability and proper operation of the system, but we didn't just blanket install all of them. So one of those PTFs that we received but did not apply is this UI01301, uh, which is a prerequisite for the current sysmod we're trying to install. So we'll install this one. Now if we page down, we can see that that other prerequisite, ZP60014, is a user mod which we have received and we have already applied. So this user mod is already active on our system, so we don't need to worry about it anymore. Uh, we've satisfied that prerequisite. So let's purge that job output, switch back to our editor, and we'll go ahead and just modify this SMP job again. Instead of listing, we will apply. And then for apply, we use the select uh, parameter here. And we're selecting the modification we want to apply to our system, which is UI01301. That ZP014 is already installed. So what this is doing is out of that whole pool of possible modifications that we've received, uh, we're telling it we only want to select this one to apply. So let's go ahead and submit that job and see if that worked. May as well rename it um, Wilson A for apply, just so we can identify that easily. Okay, job submitted. And it's on our output queue here. Let's take a look at that. We got a condition code of zero, which is what we like to see. And our element summary report for apply processing. Um, let's see, actually I'll go up a little bit from that. Yeah, so sysmod UI01301 has been applied successfully. Okay, so we've taken care of the prerequisites. We can purge these extra jobs here. And now we're ready to move on and uh, we'll take a look at the new modification we want to install, the ZP60038. So let's switch back to the web browser. Take a look if there's any other important information here. Uh, you can see special conditions, a CLPA must be performed at IPL time for this sysmod to become active. 
Okay, so before we can use the capabilities that the sysmod installs, we're going to need to re-IPL the system uh, and rebuild the link pack area. We know how to do that. And then there's a note here that the module supplied uh, calls an entry point created by sysmod ZP60014. So that's why ZP60014 is a prerequisite for this user mod. It's because uh, it depends on an entry point created by this other one. Okay, so pretty straightforward. We should just be able to install this and then re-IPL CLPA, and we'll have this new capability. So I'm going to download this, copy that link. I'll go back over to my Linux shell. We have our downloads directory for the various stuff we grab from the internet. Let's download that. Let's unzip that. And if we take a look at the JCL, this was the one file that was in the zip archive. We can see that this is uh, just a JCL job stream that has several steps to uh, to put this user mod together, uh, I think, to receive it, to assemble and link the module, and eventually uh, install it. We're, we're receiving it and applying it through SMP. Uh, so now that we installed IND dollar file and files so that we can send and receive files using our uh, 3270 terminal. I'm going to go ahead and bring this JCL job stream up into our mainframe and then submit it from there. And then as we need to edit it and tweak it, uh, we'll be doing that on the mainframe instead of out in the Linux environment. So let's get ourselves to a TSO prompt. We can just do that from within RFE. I'm going to use control right square bracket to get to the C3270 prompt. We'll use the transfer command. Yes, I want to send a file from my workstation. That was zp60038.jcl. I want to place it on my mainframe. I'm just going to put it in my, along with the rest of my... Uh, my JCL job streams. We'll put it in that control library. We'll call it ZP60038. Host type is TSO. In this case, because it is an ASCII file on our Linux box, we want to upload it as ASCII so it gets correctly translated to EBSDIC. Um, we'll remove this, any CRs, CRLFs, remap the character set. Uh, these, uh, since we're uploading into an existing data set, we're not allocating a new data set, uh, none of these parameters matter. We'll just leave them as default. And then the buffer size is just how big the transfer buffer is. We'll continue. Now we'll upload. And uh, now if we go to our data set list again, browse my control library, there it is. We have our ZP. 60038 member here. So the first thing I'll do before running it is just change the job name to M. Wilson Z. Uh, message class X is appropriate for our system. That will place it in our held output queue. Greg is not a user on my system. In fact, I'm not going to bother notifying any user at all. We'll just watch our out list uh, and we'll be able to identify when the job is done from there. So with that, let's see if we can install this user mod. We'll submit this job. Okay, job submitted. Uh, I believe F9, I still have our out list over here. Yep. Okay, let's take a look at the output. Job not run, JCL error. So let's scroll down and see if we can identify that error. Uh, here we go. So line 61, procedure not Bound. So we're trying to call a JCL catalog procedure that is not on our system. Let's go up again and look at what 61 is. Okay, step of five exec, uh, SMP ACC. So that's the problem. On our system, uh, our convenience job for running SMP is called SMP APP for apply instead of accept. Um, I see on some systems both exist. Uh, on others, it's one or the other. Uh, where they both exist, there may be subtle differences in the data set allocations that are made. But as far as I've been able to tell on our system, we can always just use SMP APP 
uh, and it's always worked for me. So let's go ahead and change that. Let me get out of that, purge that old error run, switch back to the editor. Um, let's find that SMP ACC. There it is. So we'll just change that to SMP APP. And that should match the catalog procedure on our system. So let's submit that again. Okay, it's submitted. I'm going to hit F9 to switch over to my other session. And let's see what happened this time. All right, we got farther. Uh, it looks like the first step completed successfully. However, the next step, the assembler, was not executed. And then job failed due to JCL error. So why is that? Once again, let's scroll down until we see something that looks to be in error. Okay, so that was that first step running IEB Jenner that completed successfully. So we'll expect uh, the next step is where we failed. Sure enough, one of the nice things about this capability is it highlights certain errors in bright red, so they're hard to miss. I like that. Uh, so step zero two, it looks like in the syslib DD concatenation, uh, the the data set with offset three was not found. Okay, let's switch back over. And that was what, step 02? Let's find step 02. And sure enough, the syslib concatenation, offset one, two, three, is this sys1.apvt max. Uh, now, the review editor here has a really nice feature, which it recognizes data set names and uh, highlights them differently depending on their status. In this case, these first three exist. You can see the data set name is green and underlined. This fourth one, however, is not underlined, and it's this blue color. And so that's RFE's way of telling us, you know, hey, you're referencing a data set here that does not exist, or at least isn't cataloged in the system. And that corresponds with the error that we got from the job log, uh, the you know index three, so zero index zero one two three in syslib does not exist. Well, so what is this? Where does it come from? Uh, through some searching and some research, it looks like this is an additional assembler macro library that was included on some additional program materials tapes with MVS three point eight. Uh, now, I am not able to find an original source of those tapes, so we can't go and grab that tape and install them through SMP or something like that. However, uh, in later TK3 and our beloved TK4- system, this library does exist. So what I'm going to do is go over to a TK4- system and grab the sys1 apvt max uh, macro library, put it on my system, and then we should be able to proceed. Uh, and we'll have the additional capabilities of these macros as if we had installed from that additional program materials tape uh, that may have been included when you ordered your mainframe from IBM back in the late 70s. So lucky for me, uh, I have access to a TK4- system. And uh, because I may not have physical access to these machines to take a tape over to my buddy's mainframe, <laughs> copy this library down onto the tape, bring it back, mount the tape on my mainframe, and load it up, uh, because we have that transmit and receive capability and end file to download and upload files through our 3270 emulator, we can do all of this strictly through our 3270 access to the mainframes. So we had the video, it was video 14 of mine, where we got a bit of a Receive 370 tutorial. So let's look at how we use Transmit 370 uh, to, to do the other side of that process. So I'm gonna exit out of this. Uh, on our system, remember, Receive 370 and Transmit 370 are in this sys C volume and high-level qualifier. And the documentation is provided along with the source code for this utility. So let's look at that. And just like we have the receive documentation, we also have the transmit documentation. So let's read that file. 
can you read more about this? Uh, but in particular, it looks like we have some demonstration JCL, but then we also have the documentation if we want to put the JCL together ourselves. So it looks like it's similar to receive 370 and that we have a number of DD names that are going to be required when we are working with partitioned data sets. Uh, because again, behind the scenes, transmit and receive are using IEB copy to help load and unload partitioned data sets. And then we have some required DD names for transmit itself with a temporary work data set, an input data set, an output data set. Um, so we'll just go ahead and, and allocate sysprint to sysout. We'll allocate the xmit log to sysout. Sysut1 is our input data set. SysUT2 is our work data set, uh, which is going to be required when we're working with partitioned data sets, which we are in this case. And it gives us some guidance here of how large it needs to be. It needs to be large enough to contain SysUT1, so it needs to be as, at least as large as our input data set, plus a little more, uh, because there's probably going to be some overhead in terms of how IEB copy identifies the various members inside of that. Um, that partition data set when it's flattening it out to a sequential data set. And this will be deleted at the end of the step if it's okay. Okay. And then xmit out will be our output file in that transmit format. Uh, it says any DCB attributes you specify are currently ignored. So it sounds like we don't really need to specify the DCB. This will just be a fixed block, uh, 80 logical record length uh, data set. It should be large enough to contain the input data set plus some more for the XMIT 370 wrapper. So again, the overhead of flattening those partition data sets into the transmit file format. Uh, it says here 10 to 20% more should be sufficient. So that's nice. They give us some guidance there. Uh, SysIn needs to be a dummy data set. And then debug is optional. So we won't worry about that. Okay, so that makes sense, right? It's uh, it's pretty much just the reciprocal of the receive 370 data sets where we have a couple of message log, um, sysprint, xmit log, output data sets, and then we have our input, we have our work area, and we have our output. So with that knowledge, uh, I'm going to, I'll create a new screen window here. So session four here, let's name it so we don't get lost. This is going to be our TK4 minus system. So I can connect. Uh, it happens to be on the same system, but running on a different port. And here's our TK4 minus system. So let's log on as Herco1. Um, this is just a freshly unzipped, newly installed system here. Um, Let's see, the password there is that see you later password. Uh, communists do it without class. Okay. So we'll go into RFE here. And if you look, we can confirm that sure enough, uh, sys1.apvtmax, it does exist on this TK4 minus system. So what I want to do to get that on my system is we're going to transmit it from here into uh, a, a sequential data set in transmit format. We'll use end file just to download that file then from the TK4 system to my local uh, Linux workstation. We'll then switch back over to my mainframe and upload it again through the 3270 terminal emulator using end file and we'll receive it. And then we will have this data set over on our system. So let's get some information on this. Um, so it looks like this is currently on a 3350 volume, uh, which is nice because I'm going to drop this on our MVS001 volume over on our mainframe, which is also a 3350. So all of these space uh, usage numbers are going to correspond to the same, the same DASD type. Um, so it looks like we have fixed block, 80 logical record length with 19,040 block size. We're currently using 190 tracks. So that's how much space we're actually taking. Uh, we've allocated 287 tracks. So we have quite a bit of free space in here. And uh, there's 242 members. So it looks like we've allocated 35 directory blocks out of which we're using 
17. So with those numbers, we'll know how much space to allocate for the future steps here. All right, so I'm guessing there's probably already a data set in here for me to write um, some JCL. Yep, it looks like this test control, that'll, that'll do. We can go ahead and edit our transmit member here, and we'll just create a new job oops, uh, called Herco1T for transmit. And let's say uh, this is going to be job, and I don't know if this system requires like an account number and program uh, programmer name, so we'll include those. It's class A. Message class on a TK4 minus for held output is class H, so we'll indicate that. And then we'll go ahead and just have our uh, our transmit step here is going to be program transmit 370. We don't need a step lib line over on the TK4 minus system because transmit 370 is already in a library that is included in the system uh, library concatenation. Okay, so going back to the notes I took from that transmit 370 documentation, we need a sysprint dd, and that is going to be uh, just some output from IEB copy. We need a transmit log dd, which we'll also send to sys out. Sysut1 is our input, so that is going to be sys1.apvt max disposition shared we need our sysut 2 dd this is our temporary work area so i am just going to allocate this on uh, let's see let's go unit equals i don't know if we have any random 3350s available uh how do i want to do this i'm, I'm actually just going to say unit equals sysda, and we will make a new, um, let's see, new, and then when we're done, we'll delete, since it's just temporary, and we need to give that an adequate amount of space. So let's say space is going to be tracks, let's see, remember how to do this correctly, um, Tracks, we're currently using 190 out of 287. We need some overhead. Uh, so 250 should be more than adequate. We'll let it grow by 50 at a time if it needs to, but it shouldn't need to. Uh, so I think that's going to be sufficient to allocate this new data set. We don't need to name it or anything because it's just temporary. And then our transmit output, this guy we're going to give a name. Uh, let's just call it herco1.apvtmax.transmit, maybe. This one we want to create. We want to catalog it uh, if this job is successful. If there's a problem, we'll just go ahead and delete it. And again, we're going to give it some space. And that should be good. It said any DCB is ignored, so we're just not going to provide a DCB. It will go ahead and allocate it as a fixed block 80. I think that's all we need. Oh, let's see. We also need sysin as a dummy data set. Okay, so we're going to use transmit 370 to send sys1.apvt max, which is a partition data set, into a sequential data set called herco1apvt max.xmit with this space allocation. Submit that. We will start a new session with 3.8. Uh, we will look at our status here. And yeah, so it didn't like that. Transmit out unit field specifies incorrect device name. Um, so it does not appreciate our 
uh, oh, xmit out. Oh, sorry, my mistake. We did not put a unit on transmit out, so that's easy enough to fix. Let's go back here, transmit out. Yeah, we need a unit equals sysda. Okay, let's submit that again, and then go back and look at the output. Okay, that looks better. We got a return code of zeros. And if we just quickly go through here, we should see the output. Yeah, so we're gonna see a lot of these lines of all of these members of that library being unloaded. And then I believe, uh, yeah, so we're not using a, a DD name called copy R1. So we're not, uh, we're not worried about that. All right. And if we look in Herco one again, we now have this APDV max transmit data set. So let's go to a TSO prompt and we will use the control right square bracket to get to the prompt here. We'll transfer, continue yes. And we would like to receive a file from the mainframe. And that file is Herco one dot ap vtmax.xmit. On the workstation, let's just drop that in temp apvtmax.transmit. It's a TSO system. In this case, we just want to maintain it as a binary file. If the destination file exists, yeah, we'll keep it. It shouldn't exist. That's our buffer size. And yes, we would like to transfer. Quite a lot of assembler macro going on there. Okay, looks like it's uh, nearly three megabytes of data. I'll hit enter there. Uh, and now we're done with the TK4 minus system. We've gotten that data off of it that we need. We can go ahead and log off. And in fact, I'm just going to go ahead and quit this session so that we don't have it down here confusing us anymore. So now I'm back to my mainframe and I need to send that transmit file up. So I'm going to go to the TSO prompt and we can do the same thing. Control, close bracket, transfer, continue. Yes. In this case, yes, I want to send. Uh, in this case, I want to send that temp apvt max dot transmit. And I'm going to call it in wilson.apvtmax.transmit. It is in fact TSO, it is a binary file, and I want to make sure it is the correct format here. So it's going to be fixed 80. Um, but in this case, I'll just go 5,600. I'm going to let it allocate space on its own. And I'll be curious to see if that works, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so yes, we will upload. Um, the reason I said I'll be curious to see if it works is because like I said, what did we determine? It was nearly two megs, nearly three megs. Uh, I'll be curious to see if this process allocated a large enough data set for us to send that much data up to, or if it's going to fail and we'll need to uh, either pre-allocate or explicitly allocate that much space. So far so good though, so fingers crossed.
Okay, we're nearly there, so it looks like it will work. That's nice. All right, transfer complete. So let's look at what we got. There we go, Emulsion, apvtmax.transmit. Um, so we did receive that file successfully. That's great. One thing I want to just confirm is I think I have a volume called MVS. Is it MVS000? Yes, so MVS000 is a 3350. Um, and it looks like it has nearly 10,000 free tracks. So our, uh, what did we say? This guy was using about 190 and I allocated 287. So plenty of space on this volume. I think I will go ahead and put this uh, macro library on MVS triple zero rather than one of our kind of user volumes, pub 001 or triple uh, zero, because it is, right, it's kind of a system thing, uh, even though we're not installing it through SMP. So, from our previous videos, we do have a receive uh, JCL job already written here. So let's go ahead and edit that, and we'll just adapt our existing job to receive this new data set. So, Emulsion R, Master Class X, we're running receive 370 with our step lib. Um, SysUT1, this is going to be the temporary work area. So in this case, let's give it uh, space measurements and tracks. Uh, we'll just go ahead and give it, you know, we should need probably no more than 250. Um, and in this case, we know that that was on a 3350 volume, although for the temporary space, it really shouldn't matter, but we'll just put it on work double zero for good measure. The input file is that file we just uploaded. So that's gonna be mwilson.apvtmax.transmit. Again, you can see that that changed to a nice underlined green. That's RFE's way of telling us that that data set exists. And then sysut2 is our output. So this time we want that output to be a new library called sys1.apvtmax. Disposition new cataloged. This one we do want on the 3350 volume named MVS000. And, uh, you know, we may as well just replicate the allocation from the other system. Ah, it seems excessive because we're not really gonna ever add anything to this. So let's just give it 210. It should never need to grow, but if it does, it's got 50. And then we'll give it uh, 25 directory blocks because we were previously using 17 out of the 35 that were allocated. So we're gonna receive it to sys1.apvt max. That's a new data set on a 3350 called MVS000. And we've given it, uh, a little bit more space than was actually being used on the source 3350. So that should be adequate with a little bit of headroom. So let's see what happens. Submit that, go over to our, oh, I see we got a console message down here. Um, let me go over to the MBS console. Okay, and because this is a, uh, a new data set we're cataloging up in Sys1, that's going to be cataloged in the master catalog. So we need a, uh, our, our master catalog is password protected. So we'll reply one with the password, which is sysprog. Okay, now we can see that completed successfully. So back over in MVS, let's take a look at that receive job just for good measure and confirm that yes, it completed successfully. And if we look at the output, we can see all of those assembler macros have been loaded. Okay, so take a uh, take a deep breath and just breathe a little bit, relax, you've earned it. Uh, we've moved that sys1.apvt max library, which we can now check, apvt max. Uh, we've moved that over to our system from the TK4 minus system using transmit 370 and receive 370. 
So now, remember, the reason we did all of that, and in fact, I can delete this transmit file now because we've, we've successfully received it. The reason we did all of that is because we wanted to install this ZP60038 system modification. Uh, so we got the error that the sys1.apvtmax library did not exist. We've corrected that error. So let's just submit this again. Okay. Um, it looks like it's assembling. Okay, it's finished. Let's see what we got. And look at that, success. So we got return codes of zero for all of the steps, uh, including the receive and apply step. So if we go down to the bottom here, you'll see the last thing we did was we did actually apply ZP60038, uh, and that status there applied means that it worked. So we're done. Uh, now, I'm going to purge that. The last thing is, remember, the, uh, the cover letter said that we do need to uh, IPL with the CLPA parameter. So for good measure, for this user mod to take effect, let's go ahead and do that now. So we can shut down our system. So our normal process is to uh, cancel TSO and to stop VTAM. And then to stop just two. So that's closed its data sets. Normally I'd wait for the final JES2 has stopped message, but that takes a little while. And since we're not just going to sit here and wait on the video, I'll uh, I'll proceed to the ZEOD EOD step. And that's never toasted my my JES2 install too much. And then we can quiesce. So back over in the Hercules console, which we haven't seen for a while, we'll re-IPL, so IPL from 150 again. Over on the MVS console, normally we'd hit enter here, but we need to rebuild uh, that link back area, so we reply zero with the option CLPA. Uh, those errors you saw are normal. Again, the uh, Jay Mosley's instructions mentioned that, that those errors are expected. Okay, so now that we've done that, um, we don't need to do a cold start of JES2. We just needed to do a cold start of, of MVS itself to rebuild the CLPA. So we can just do our normal R0 no rec here. We hit F12 so that the console will scroll. And we can once again start VTAM. And if we switch back to our TSO session, I should now be able to log on to the system again, and everything still works. Uh, so at this point, if you knew how to use that, what was it, IKJ something something for something, <laughs> what were we doing here? The IKJCT441 API, uh, you would now be able to write a program in Assembler or presumably other languages that can access these things. Uh, and get access to your CList environment variables. So on its own, not a lot we can now uh, show as a, a neat payoff for having done all of that work. However, I think this was good, important work to do for our system because one, we now have that sys1.apvt macro library, uh, which appears to have a ton of assembler macros in it. So I haven't really looked into what a lot of them do, but those are now available for us or for any other programs uh, source code or system modifications to use. Uh, it looks like there may be an expectation sometimes that those are there. And we've also installed a prerequisite for Wally McLaughlin's ISPF package, uh, which I believe will be integrated into that next TK4- uh, distribution update that is coming uh, later this summer. Um, but if we get in touch with Wally and he sends it to us for us to install on our own system, we're now in a position to take full use of its capabilities because we've installed that ZP60038 prerequisite. It also gave us an excuse to look at the other side of Receive 370, which is Transmit 370. So if all you have is 3270 uh, you know, TSO access to two different mainframes, you've now seen how you can use that access to grab data from one mainframe, transfer it down, transfer it up to your other mainframe, and restore that data. 
So I hope all that was interesting and instructive. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I always appreciate thumbs up if you did in fact uh, find this particular video interesting. And feel free to subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see other new videos like it. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.